It's time to sit down and relax for the good, the bad, and the sequel Q&A with your host, Doug. Hey there. Last week's sequel was Home Alone 3, which is definitely going in my family's holiday movie rotation for sure. And as promised, this week I am interviewing someone who was involved in the film, and we are lucky enough to have two. So for this week, the interview is going to be with Lenny Van Dolan, who played bad guy Burton Jernigan in the film. Early on in Lenny's career, he was in the classic Tender Mercies, starring Robert Duvall. Actually, Robert Duvall won the Oscar for Best Actor for that film. What a way to start his career in Hollywood, right? (laughs) And then he went on to star in the cult classic Electric Dreams, but he's most famous for his role as Harold Smith on Twin Peaks. He grew up in a small town in Texas and a small town for me in New Jersey. We had a similar childhood. I love chatting with him, and I know you'll enjoy his storytelling for sure. So let's start the interview. Hey, Lenny. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you. Um, Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Is this a good connection? Can you hear me all right? Oh, it sounds great. All right, then. There's a lot of construction going on in this part of uh, town. It's uh, oh, yeah. I, not since the early days of Hollywood, I think, have uh, has there been such a, a spurt of building everywhere. Anyway. Well, at least it's not overnight, I hope. Uh, no. But, uh, but but it's it's sometimes it seems like it you know progress. Yeah. When you hear it all day, you need a couple of aspirin, maybe some some noise canceling headphones, and try to drown it out. But no, I don't hear it at all. So okay, good. good. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. So when I do this, I just like to go people through people. I think everybody has a great story. So uh, yeah, just be able to like, go through how you got started, things like that, and then uh, yeah, talk about some of the great work that you've done and. Uh, so I see here you're you're born in Augusta, Georgia. Is that right? That 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 actually is uh, correct. Yeah, but I was so only you... there for um, uh, a short amount of time. Uh, my father was in the Army Reserves there, and uh, and once I was born, they very soon after uh, moved to Texas, where I was reared, as they say. <laughs> but yeah, no, I was thinking because the timing of this, and then I saw you—you you grew up in Texas. But at first, right. I just saw Augusta, and I was thinking, oh, it's the Masters weekend. So I, was like, I oh, know. I, saw. <laughs> I know. I should, by all rights, you know, be a, a whiz with the clubs, but I don't even play. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. No, but you did. Uh, what 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 grew to your fondness of? Uh, Wanting to be a jockey, what age did you have that? Oh, well, that was all because of my family's uh, interest in horse race, quarter horse racing. Um, my grandfather uh, owned uh, race horses, and my father uh, built uh, what was at one time the largest non paramutual track in the country. And I was in my little hometown of Goliad, Texas. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. So, you know, for a long time there wasn't league paramutual betting. That's what that is. There wasn't that for Texas. The Baptists, you know, went out in droves and never voted it in until now. Oh, wow. And, uh, is that track and, still there? Alas, no. Um, when those, you know, they, they kept coming up against that wall and those bills never passed so um anyway when it finally did pass uh oh it's too complicated but for a time it was a golden time and uh i loved everything about that world um uh, and uh, uh now of course with everything that's happened recently at Santa Anita and it's been happening <laughs> forever but yeah I have a little bit of a different kind of 
perspective, but at that time, um, for my money, jockeys were the pound for pound the best athletes alive because they kept this, you know, this mega powerful, <laughs> highly muscled creature under control. And, uh, and they had all these beautiful blondes waiting for them. At the end of the day, I just thought they were incredible. And, uh, if one of them, you know, broke an arm or a leg or whatever, all the other jockeys would go up in the stands with their helmets and take a collection for that guy's family, you know. And oh, that, wow. You know, that kind of camaraderie, you know, made an impression. And, uh, of course, the discipline uh, to try to make that weight, uh, I would see some of these guys on a horribly hot afternoon, sitting in their car, the windows rolled up, and wow. then open, opening the door and, you know, vomiting and then closing the door. And, I mean, that's how they made the weight. What was and, the weight? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, top weight for quarter horses uh, was uh, like 120. Wow. 125, maybe. So... You know that wasn't in the cards for me. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I would. Say. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, it says you're six one. Yeah, that'd be pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that was a that was a dashed dream, as they say. And uh, but I I loved it, and uh, uh, it was very exciting, and uh, it was especially beautiful to see my normally uh, reserved. Uh, sweet grandfather break out into this smile when one of his horses won a race. It was thrilling, you know. Yeah. And, no, I grew up going to the track a lot. I, I'm for, I'm born and raised in New Jersey. Oh. There's a bunch of tracks out here. And my dad, that, other kids were doing uh, uh, maybe like family more events on Saturdays. I was going to the track either at, you, you know, the Meadowlands or Mammoth Park or Freehold. My dad was taking me down there and I knew all the jockeys' names at, like, eight, nine years old. He would throw them baseballs when they were done and get them to autograph stuff for me. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. No, I enjoyed wow. it. It was it was fun. Yeah. It's such a unique uh, life. You know, it's about passion, too. And I think that's how the segue happened and maybe, I don't know, into the theater. It's, it's a stretch. But there's certainly... It's a topsy turvy life as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, when did you start uh, in doing theater? I, you know, in uh, high school, uh, I was in these one act plays, and uh, uh, you know, we did well at these things, these things, and I thought I like, I kind of like this, and that, and it was. You know, it was just me and two other people in the drama department. That's how <laughs> that's how <laughs> small a town I grew up in. But um How many do you remember how many were in your graduating class? Seventy two. Seventy two? Yeah, I had uh three like three sixty. So seventy two. Wow. I know. My father, uh when he graduated from high school in that same town, uh this would have been 1954, there were uh, 17 people in his class. Wow. Oh, so that's you know? cool. So you guys, grew, you grew up where your father grew up. That's neat. That's progress, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. And and my, my and my family, you know, still lives there. My mother's still there. And oh, it's, that's uh, great. It's a beautiful little historical town that I couldn't wait, wait. to leave. But now, I have a hard time leaving sometimes. Yeah, probably, yeah. You go back. So, and it's so simpler, quiet. Simpler mm -hmm. times, yeah. You don't worry about but, the big construction that they're doing. <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the thing is, I I do come back. I always come back because, Yeah. <laughs> well, I heard the bell ring a long time ago, and I answered it, you know. <laughs> and then you keep, yeah, you keep hearing it. So when I moved did you, to New uh, York. So yeah, I moved to oh, New York. Oh, that's the. You moved to New yeah. York. I moved to New York 
the theater was the place for me and uh and uh so right out of college I moved there. I'd never been there before. I just moved there with my one big suitcase and a and How'd you book. get there? Did you did you drive or fly in? I flew. I flew in um to Kennedy. Uh it was uh just after the new year of 1980 and um uh god i can remember going over all those streets and just i mean amsterdam looks nothing like it did then you oh, know, sure. it was you know a little rough and uh <laughs> anyway yeah then the love affair began and i uh I, uh, I just, I, 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 you know, I just, I just fell in love with her like only a small town boy can, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Were you, were you kind of like taken back, like how big this? Because I remember the first time, even growing up in New Jersey, the first time going into New York City, we take the train yeah. in and you go under the water, and then you, uh, and then you come out underneath the Madison Square Garden. You walk out. I remember being a kid, the first time walking up the steps. It was just like everything was so. Big and I was so small. Even to this day, when I go into the city, it's still that like whoa, like yeah. <laughs> I know it. That's it's in the business of inspiring all. <laughs> you know, oh, that's yeah. job. and it does me too. Every time I would fly back there from being away, I'd get a lump in my throat, you know, and yeah. it, it, it just uh, I couldn't believe that I was there doing. This thing I loved, and uh, yeah, I felt pretty lit, as they say. Yeah. So, I so when I look, <laughs> yeah. when I look at people's IMDb's, sometimes uh, their first like film work uh, isn't right. But let's see if they're right for you. It has your first credit as uh, uh, Kent State. Dead right. That's where, was that, where was that filmed at? Was it filmed like... Oh, man, that was in Gadsden, Alabama. So, I, you know, just got to New York, really. I got lucky and went off to do this job. First time I really made money as an actor. And, oh, wow. uh, and it was pretty, pretty quick. It was a TV movie of the week, but it was more than just a TV movie of the week. You know, it was a, a, it was an event. Because oh, yeah. this was 1980, and the killings in Kent State happened in 1970, so it was only 10 years, and uh, yeah, so that was exciting to be a part of that because we felt like we were. Uh, it raised everybody's political consciousness that was a part of that, uh, you know, uh, film. Who, who like myself, didn't really wasn't clocking. You know, in 1970, uh, what it, what our country was capable of, you know, sending a National Guard to the oh, kids. Yeah. Yeah. What? Hello? I know. It's wild. Uh, so that was, that was, uh, uh, a really, uh, kind of crucial thing for me to be a part of. It was, it was, it, it just, it, it, it meant something. It, it seemed to be about something that we needed to, all look at and everybody involved was uh, so committed you know it was a lot of our first jobs like Ellen Barkin and um, oh, the whole oh, Ellen, Bar Ellen Barkin was in that too? I yeah. didn't see her name on there yeah she was in it and uh, oh my mind is blanking um, but there was quite a few of us all of us from New York and uh, so that got me that got me going. So doing this, looking at people's IMDb, there's obviously millions of movies that have been made, and that, you know you can't watch them all. But from doing this, I've seen so many movies that I've never heard of before, and I I wish I did. But then I put them on a list that I want to watch, and there's a few of them like right away in your career that I definitely need to check out. And the first is uh, Tender Mercies, where I saw you know that was Robert Robert Duvall and Ellen Barker was in that too, right? That was the third time Ellen and I worked together. Yeah, um, wow. We she was in the first play 
workshop I ever did in New York. She was my she played my girlfriend in this thing called Bless Me Father for I Have Sinned about this young fourteen year old boy who listens to the radio and masturbates on the radiator. But um uh that was me. And uh and that was when we first met and then uh we did Kent State and uh, she said she wouldn't talk to us because she was playing a we, I was a national guardsman, you know, and she yeah. was she was a, a protester. So you know, we <laughs> we drew the line. <laughs> we were, yeah. we were, we were. That's how we rolled back then. And then <laughs> uh, and then we did tender mercies, and I you couldn't have been more shocked than I was at this little motel in Waxahachie, Texas, to see Ellen Barkin walking down the breezeway at me, and I thought. What is Ellen from Brooklyn doing here? You know, and uh, she had on her Walkman, and she had had some local girl record all of her lines, you know, in that accent. And she did a great job, great job. Yeah, that movie. I watched the trailer, and uh, looks amazing. And it won a couple Academy Awards. I think screenplay and Robert Duvall won Best Actor, and. Uh, and he was and is, um, he's one, you know, he's one of our national treasures. I felt that watching him, I felt so lucky. I, I was so excited to work with him because I knew his work and I knew a little bit about him. So uh I was so excited that I got up like two hours before my call time and ran around the same said motel and then... Uh, shoved my face in the ice machine uh, so that I would be good and awake because I wasn't a morning person so that yeah. I would be good and awake when I faced off with Mr. Duvall in front of those cameras. Little did I know that it would be, you know, five or six hours before <laughs> we'd ever <laughs> shoot the scene, you know, the movie. <laughs> but these are things you learn. Yeah, and, uh, and to be able to work with him in you know your second film, that's our first like big movie that not not TV movie. It's like to be able to work with him. That's yes, it was a, it was a really lucky lucky thing. And Horton Foote and Bruce Bearsford, uh, this amazing filmmaker from Australia, and. Uh, would you would you call home and be like, oh yeah, I worked with, uh, I did a scene today with Robert Duvall, and then people were, like floored because I, I know my family floored, would be like, uh, oh really? Yeah, no, they didn't. You know, my my, not my I think my mom when I said, yeah, I'm gonna do, I think they they cast me as the leader of this country western band in this movie with Robert Duvall, mom, and she said, oh, now tell me who he is again. And I just thought, oh, fuck, you know. Um, but she she knows who he is now. And, uh, oh, that's good. Uh, and, in fact, she and, and my father came to visit the set one day, and uh, they were all so sweet to my parents. And, uh, oh, that's cool. It was a magical, a magical experience. Yeah, then right after that, starring role. Looks like you were the number one on the call sheet for Electric Dreams. Wasn't that lucky again? Um, yeah, um, I um, I was back in New York doing my plays and happy and um, Rusty Limerand, who wrote Electric Dreams and produced it, had seen Tender Mercies and uh, and seen me and wanted to meet me for this part and I was well first of all I was very buoyed up by that because you know this was a San Francisco architect you know and and you know I, I just you know I was afraid that I was going to be playing good old boys from you know from, from now until kingdom come or something you know so yeah. you think that when you you know um, but then uh I got to go and do this great thing and uh and as you say, carry a movie and and I was 
extremely blessed because I had the creme de la creme of um, British cinema uh, as uh, my uh, crew and my teachers. Uh, uh, Alex, Alex Thompson was the lighting and uh, Peter McDonald who did Cabaret was our cameraman and uh, Roy Shaman. I mean, all these, you know, top of the top pros and you had this greenhorn, uh, me, who they were just so tender with and, and took time to uh, explain things to me about, well, just about everything. And uh, because we were together for five, six months. And, uh, um, oh, and we took tea breaks. That was fantastic because we were tea breaks. <laughs> tea breaks, man. <laughs> yes, um, long about four o'clock comes the tea trolley, and uh, and it's it's all very civilized. And uh, um, so I don't know. It just it was a great uh, experience all the way around. Yeah, it's definitely like watching the trailer. It was like really weird, funny, and just the way it was shot. Looks so cool, and it was Virginia Madsen's first first movie from what it had on her IMDb. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, I think she might have done something before that, but certainly her yeah. first yeah first lead role. We were both um, uh, we shot the exteriors in San Francisco, so we were there for about a month, and then we flew from San Francisco to Heathrow. And we drank champagne the whole way over there. That is what you can do when you're, you know, 25, under 25. I don't know how. I don't I think we, she's two years younger than me. Anyway, um, we we uh, we retreated, uh, you know, so well by MGM, and that that uh, kind of spoils you for the rest of your yeah. life. <laughs> you think you put that up home. Well, no, no, you you, you got to learn to uh, to rock and roll in this business. Pivot. Yeah, <laughs> I was reading that was uh, uh, Virgin, Richard Branson. Yes. That was that was produced by them, right? That's correct. That was their second film. Their first film being uh, 1984 with Richard Burton and John yeah. Hurt. And uh, was he around at all, Richard Branson? He was. He was not a not a whole lot, but he came to set at least twice, and uh, and uh, he was very supportive and uh, invited me once to his house, to his barge house, whatever his <laughs> for a party, and I stupidly, you know, as you say, number one on the call sheet. I had a big big workload in early early morning and. That's one of the few regrets of my life I didn't do that. But that was, you know, what I did for love, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's true. You were thinking about the work, and maybe maybe secretly you appreciated that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I still would have got a gander at that barge. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. No, he seems uh, like a guy that uh, can just talk to anyone. He seems really down to earth. Oh, he's so effusive and uh, enthusiastic about everything, and that's, yeah. you know, that's nice to be around. Yeah, no, definitely have somebody that's supportive. And then another another movie a few years later, again, another one that I never heard of that I'm going to check out, a Dracula's Widow. What's your next one on the list? <laughs> Did you not like that movie? Uh, oh, no, you stumped me, Doug. Oh, no, no, I can, I can take this part out. No, I just thought it was uh, interesting when I clicked on it, and uh, I was, uh -huh. like, reading into it. It was uh, Nick Cage's brother directed it. Looked like That's it was right. his first movie, and... Uh, yep, 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 super, uh, super interesting man, and uh, had a real strong visual sense of what he wanted to do, and... Uh, yeah, uh, it was, uh, well, since she's gone now, I can say it, but, uh, 
it was meant to be uh, me and uh, Isabella Rossellini as, as the title role, and she got pregnant. And Isabella Rossellini was out, and Sylvia Crestel was in, and uh, and that you know changed a lot of things. But uh, anyway, uh, it was uh, an experience. Yeah. So we'll, yeah. we'll go on to the next. No, it looked like one of those, because even in the trailer at first, I thought it was more of like a horror-ish, and then the trailer was kind of almost like a Kentucky Fried Chicken or like uh, Transylvania 65,000, but it had some silly jokes like that and references oh, in it. Yes, I mean, I didn't take it seriously. Uh, I mean, I wasn't taking it seriously by any yeah. means. Hopefully it's funny. Uh, yeah. You know. Uh, anyway. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So <laughs> over the years, <laughs> so over the years, you're in a lot of great series uh, that you guest starred on. Uh, but the one, obviously, that you're, I would say, you're most known for is Twin Peaks. Now, before you landed the role of Harold Smith, were you a fan? Were you a fan of it, season one? No, I'm afraid I. I was the uninitiated, um, and um, so when I became a fan, uh, it was because they had hired me and they sent up all the tapes uh, on VHS, <laughs> and uh, I watched them, and it, it, was, it was like an acid trip, I think, you know? Oh, so uh, the first time me and my wife watched it, I watched the first one, it was on Netflix, and you yes. know, at the end, when it, Netflix is like the next episode starting in 10, 9, 8, it would have that countdown. We were looking at, we looked at each other and we were like, well, what did we just watch? And then we just kept watching and kept watching. And then we finished it all within, I think, a week. We finished the whole series, but. <laughs> wow. Well, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I saw that and I just thought, well, that's not. Well, I remember television being like, and sign me up, you know? Yeah. Because I, <laughs> I tend to gravitate toward rule breakers and, and people with vision, and there's nobody better in those categories than Mr. Lynch, I think. Oh, no, definitely. And, it's, and looking back, I was, I was young at the time, so I didn't watch it when it was on TV or know about it, but looking back, it's almost like that was, on, that was an ABC show, right? Pardon me? Was that on, that was on ABC, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah, for a network to have a show like that on yeah prime time, that's extraordinary, pretty wild. Yeah, just uh, you know, unbelievable. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, it was. It was <laughs> the first of, in many ways, of a lot of things that are happening now. Yeah, no, that's true. And you and Laura Flynn Boyle, Boyle had some great chemistry. Yeah, that was fun. I mean, the whole thing was fun. I just loved that part. I loved being able to create it with with the writers and find out about people who are in that situation and uh, who you know are homebound. And uh, uh, I had no I had no knowledge of that. And so people who were homebound were kind enough to talk to me on the phone. And, oh wow! Yeah. How'd, you, yeah. how'd you find? How'd you reach out to them? I went through a home homeward bound society, homebound societies, oh, wow. and uh, they're everywhere. Uh, a lot of it's it's not an uncommon affliction. I came to find out, but uh, no, but you crushed it in that role. That was uh, oh, thank you. It, it was good when you when you look back at it. It was like so eerie at yeah. times. But in a good, in a good way. And if you ever if you ever look back, I don't know if act, I'm sure some actors do this, but uh, I know if I was in a great role like that, if you look on YouTube, the comments of the, how much people loved your character and the videos that just have you know Harold Smith, it's like all your scenes. It's pretty it's pretty cool. People love no it. Kid. Really? Yeah. Well, I I don't do all the, I should I don't look at that stuff. Maybe I should. Uh, but I uh, appreciate that, and I, I think that character struck a chord. You know, um, it's just, 
Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah, because like you said, there was a lot of home. To, you know, it's something that really happened. So maybe the people that watched it maybe felt a little inkling that way, or knew someone that was that way, and you just was well, something new. And yeah, I joke that uh, anybody who lives in Los Angeles and contemplates getting on the 101 uh, <laughs> could become an agoraphobe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. Um, no, it was it was just such a rewarding thing, and then to know kind of how Harold began, and know, and I knew that he would meet his demise. I didn't know in what manner that would happen, but I knew he would do it, and by his own hand. And so to be able to create within that limited time frame, you know, from the time you meet him to the end, was uh, was a really uh, rewarding thing you don't get to. Yeah. Do you know how long you're going to be in a series? Because I know you guessed it on another, a couple other series for, like, more than one episode. Do they tell, would David Lynch tell you up front, like, hey, this is a character we're going to, yeah. we're going to be in? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew there was going to be. Yeah, exactly. So that's how it was interesting. And with uh, Twin Peaks, of course, there was wonderful directors every week, you know. Um yeah. Film directors, a lot of them too. Um uh so that kept it fresh. But I was uh always involved and intrigued with, with that world and uh yeah. The fans are the the, the brightest, most loyal uh, most interesting people I've I've met. I want, yeah, want... there's a lot of fan fiction for it, and a lot of people that talk about it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, so you're in a so many amazing things over the years, but uh, for a few years later, we'll go back and then touch some, on some other things. But uh, let's talk about the film that that. You know, I'm going to be covering, and my co-host will be covering Home Alone Three. So I was 11 at the time when I saw that. So I obviously saw the first two, and uh, this one was really—I I really liked this one growing up. And then uh, I'll, I'll hear your take and then your experience with it. But uh, it was such a cool movie. The first one were, you know, about strangers and bad guys, but this one, when John Hughes wrote it, he really like raised the stakes. You know, your crew. Uh, made, you know, the sticky or wet bandits, whichever ones you want to call them, uh, look like amateurs because you guys are, it was like a more serious thing, like something as a kid to be afraid of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. They were, uh, you know, high tech Euro, uh, spies that, uh, you know, even though they, you found out they were just as bumbling as anybody yeah. else, but, you know, to start with, they were pretty pulled together and looked like, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to mess around. They mean business. And uh, <laughs> so that puts a different spin on things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how do you remember the whole process for that, like audition-wise? Uh, I know uh, we went to Chicago uh, and then... Um, uh, Raja Gosnell, the director, was there, and uh, he kind of uh, paired us up and uh, came up with those that foursome. And uh, you know, I I, I uh, was reluctant actually when I got got the offer and. Uh, <laughs> and then finally, you know, I had to say, okay, there's too many people saying do this, and uh, and I, I, you know, I've, I've never seen this kind of money before, and uh, maybe, uh, but early on, you know, I was just too much in my serious actor head, yeah. you know, when one day I was found in this corner with the aforementioned uh, heavy head in my hands 
and uh, just shaking my head, going, what am I doing? And a wonderful hairdresser came up to me and she said, what, to adjust my one of six wigs, uh, what's wrong? And I said, I actually said, you know, what am I doing here? I've played Romeo and Hamlet and, you know, and she said, shaking her finger in my face. What's wrong with making kids laugh? And that one thing turned my whole, turned it all around for me. Oh, and wow. Luckily, that was early on in the thing, you know. And so then I began watching Three Stooges movies and Laurel and Hardy movies and, uh, and, uh, yeah, I, uh, I remember also having an epiphany about, you know, the way you look and stuff. You have when you're in the theater, you can be anybody because your imagination says you are that person, and you don't have to look back. You you don't have anything to look back, but the audience tells you you were a success. And but in film, you know, it's always there. So. Uh, how do I put this? Um, for the first time, I saw this face of mine that I've been using in <laughs> on the work as a, a mask, as a you know, as a as a clown would. And so I sort of um, it, it it was a great breakthrough. I'm not sure I'm describing it exactly right, but no, no. It's- yeah, that uh, makes a lot of sense. And so even now, you know, it's it's been a help to me. And uh, and uh, what else do you want to know? No, that, that that's great. No, it's a great story about the the hairdresser being almost like your uh, Jiminy Cricket, your your muse, even uh, to be able to help you. And then as soon as you had that, you yeah. Dove right in. No, that's really cool. I actually just interviewed uh, uh, Kevin Kilner, who played the dad. Oh yeah, great guy. He was really. Oh, he was so nice. He said sometimes on set, he goes, "I'm the dad in the movie." He goes, "I'm the parent that was never around." He, he was like really funny about the whole thing about it. And, uh, he said it was like the coldest it's ever been in Chicago. He said was, the weather was horrible, but he said oh. on set one time. He said he didn't remember if he said it to you and David Thornton or just David, but he said, man, I wish I could be the one that's getting electrocuted or beat up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that thing about the weather is true. Yeah. I have never in my life before or since seen uh, snow like that. I could, You could put your hand up, outreach your arm, and you couldn't see your hand. Wow. And it was so heavy, the snow. You'd take a cab from the hotel across the street if you were an old person to go to the restaurant, which we were with uh, Marion Selby's and Garson Kanan, the great Garson Kanan. And he was, you know, shuffling along in his 90s. And so that's how we got into the restaurant across the street in the snowstorm in a cab. It was just, it was crazy. It was, And if it wasn't actually snowing, they made it snow. Yeah. For the, you know, it was, uh, it was wild and, and great, you know, fun. What did you I think had. about the movie, like, when you ended up watching it? Well, I, I, I love seeing the response that the children have, you know, the young people yeah. have. Well, anybody has, but a lot of people had it, but the first time I saw it was a fox at a, a morning, uh, preview uh, with lots of young people and uh, it's one movie that my daughter you know could see of mine you know yeah <laughs> tender mercies yeah and the electric dreams what am I saying those two but there's been a, quite a few that um, I'd rather her not see for various reasons yeah but she she loves seeing that I said why do you love that seeing your dad get the shit beat out of him by a seven year old Oh, it's just so much fun. You know, okay, whatever rocks your boat. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah, and the movie did really well. It was 
That's really cool. To see, uh, do you know what the Beverly Center is in Los Angeles? No. Uh, well, it's a big shopping center. It's ginormous in the middle of West Hollywood. And it looks like a giant uh, spaceship just landed sort of there. And it's huge. Anyway, our uh, faces were plastered on the side of the Beverly Center, you know, uh, when that movie opened and, uh, and on buses and, and, uh. Did you know this uh, was going to happen, that advertising? Not really. I didn't <laughs> quite expect that. <laughs> I'd be driving down <laughs> La Cienega and suddenly see my frozen face on the thing, on the big <laughs> side of this thing. I'm almost have a wreck. But, um, but we did do, we did do some, uh, you know, a day of special photography for the posters and things like that. That's great. Oh, that's so cool. You're walking around the mall and you're like, it's just you, you're standing in front of a picture of you not even knowing. <laughs> no, it was on the side, outside, the side of the building. It was. Oh, it's the whole side of the building? Oh, the whole God. side of the building. That's why I almost had a wreck. Uh, um, yeah. And uh, wow. my dear friend Rhea Kilstadt, who played Alice, uh, and that's one of the other great joys of, of, of having done that film, besides making some uh, new, younger fans, um, yeah. is I got this great, wonderful, lifelong friend, you know? Uh, so, and... Uh, it bought my first home. It uh, in, uh, it uh, allowed me to keep my apartment in New York. Um, so many things yeah. that I have to thank for uh, Home Alone. So uh, that's great. So over, so over the years, you were in a lot of great series besides Twin Peaks. Any of the guest roles that you did, like right now, can like stick out in your head, and you're like, you know what? That was such a great role that I played. Hmm. Or any shows that, looking back, you're like, wow, I can't believe I was on that show. Yeah. Uh, hmm. There was a show called The Pretender. Uh, and I got to play a character called Mr. Cox, and that was a real baddie. <laughs> and uh, that was fun. You know, they're always the most fun. And, yeah. Uh, um, you know, my mother, she, <laughs> she's uh, the opposite of a stage mother, really. Um, but, um, <laughs> I, uh, she, she didn't know who Robert Duvall was, but now she does. Um, but, uh, when she, um, oh, I forgot where I was going with this. Anyway. Maybe the pretender. She what? Did you? Watch oh, the I know. She, there's a movie I did a long time ago, that's forgettable, but it's called I, Eyes of the Beholder, and I played a real baddie in that, and I killed everybody in the movie, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's like that, and. Uh, uh, my, it's one of my mom's favorites. Why? I kill everybody. And she said, oh, but it's so exciting. <laughs> That's so great. But you have yeah. to give it. If, you're, if your parents support you on something, you have to just go with it. I've learned that over the years. <laughs> Do your parents support your your life, your chosen path? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. My dad likes to bring up, he, he likes to talk about... uh when I was younger, I played Little League a lot. He's getting older, so that's the one thing that he likes to talk about, not, uh -huh. not other things. <laughs> and, and one show you were on that people always talk about over the years? Uh, 30-something? You're oh, on that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That show, from what people tell me that I have to check it out, it was, like, way ahead of its time uh, with what it talked you were about. You in 1986. No, 86. Oh, my word. 
I have blue jeans older than you. Um, <laughs> that. Anyway, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, that uh, was a beautiful show, and uh, and mine was uh, my episode that I got to do was uh, unique because it was a flashback period piece to the 1940s, so that the um, uh, the the story follows the main characters and they live in this house in Pasadena and um, and they find a trunk of old letters and it flashes back to the first owners of this craftsman house and uh, and they did it really well and uh, there was a scene where I am dancing with my sweetheart and I asked if they could if we could dance to uh, was appropriate for the period uh, Stardust because that was my grandparents' favorite song and so one of the pleasures <laughs> small pleasures I got was to see my grandparents see watch that thing and and uh, enjoy that moment oh wow that's so cool did you get to would that was that just a happen it just happenstance that that was the the song that was picked or no, I asked that they could do that. Oh, for that's me. awesome. That's it so was cool. just a, a little moment. They could have chosen anything, but they were sweet enough to. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. Is there any uh, any projects or anything that's coming out uh, soon or that's out now? That people should um, check out? The, a movie I did with the great Alan Rudolph, um, was out this year, um, or I should say late last year, um, uh, Ray Meet Helen, which is a wonderful uh, film, and I think it's on um, Amazon. Um, and it's, um, I got to play a really fun character. Um, but the main thing was to work with Alan Rudolph, you know, this one of our few great American auteurs. Uh, and he hadn't made a movie in 15 years, and uh, it was a film noir love story between Keith Carradine and the beautiful late Sandra Locke. And, uh, you know, to have this septuagenarian love story, I think that's, you know, really kicking Hollywood right in the face. I love that. I was happy to be a part of it, and especially to work with Mr. Rudolph. Yeah, what was the name of it again? Ray Meets Helen. Oh, great. I'll put a link yeah. to it in the episode notes, and I'll make sure to check it out. Yeah, do. I think you might like it. Um, I think you might like that one. Um, what does your taste run to? Black comedies or... Uh, science fiction or... I like it. I like it. I'm one of those people. I like everything. Like movie wise, I have no preference. Uh, everything from horror to comedy to drama to thriller. So there's a movie called Toll Booth. I might uh, urge you to take a look at. Um, that was made uh, in the Florida Keys, and uh, it's a really interesting <laughs> dark comedy. Um, and I bring it up because Seymour Cassell just died. He, he he was 90, I believe. No, 84. Wrong. Yeah. And uh, he was in Toll Booth with me and uh, Louise Fletcher and Feruza Bok and Will Patton. It's a great cast and a uh, uh, wonderful story and uh, very eccentric and... Uh, uh, I'll check it out. I'll put it on my list. Yeah. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, it, it is. It is. Uh, <laughs> it's in the kind of independent films I wish they made more of. Yeah. And now it says here, a toll booth attendant's fascination with a young woman who works at a gas station leads him into a love triangle and murder. That would be right. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely check that out. Well, 
Lenny, it's been awesome. When I go into these conversations, I've never talked to you before, you know, so I don't know where it's going to go, but you had some really great stories and how, like how you grew up and it's oh. really amazing. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You're easy to talk to. Oh, well, thank you. I hope I said <laughs> something. I can't believe you were 11 years old when that thing came out. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but my, uh, my daughter's 19, so I, uh, I know these things happen. Yes, they do. No, but, uh, well, I wish yeah, you no, all and, uh, yeah, and I'll make sure to put all the your IMDb to be able to check out all the stuff you're in, uh, the movies we talked about, uh, so people can find them and watch them, and uh, and I'll make sure to send over a copy of it. And uh, uh, yeah, well, thanks so much for I taking the time. Talk about? Um, oh yeah, what do you got? Well, I didn't. I just finished this really interesting film called Creator. Uh, that Andre LeBlanc directed and uh, it was in black and white and I was really excited to work in black and white because speaking of John Hughes he told me kind of early on in that rehearsal process in Chicago that I should have been in silent films because of my eyes yeah I thought what the fuck I'm here it's in color let's go what are you talking about <laughs> it really hurt my feelings at the time. <laughs> it did? Oh, man. Yeah. You should have been in silent films, you know. <laughs> so, anyway. When's that come out? On I, on your IMDb, it says 2020. Is that going to be out? or? Yeah. Yeah. We just finished it. Uh, I, I had a feeling he could finish it sooner. But, uh, cool. Um, and, uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for it. Yeah, I thought the uh yeah, the black and white thing was what made me think of it and you and your home alone sequel thing. <laughs> yeah. No, I no, I love black and white. My wife does photography, we uh for fun. And uh we've done like film noir uh like photo shoots. So uh where, No, where, no, where black and white cool. That? I'm in New Jersey. I'm about probably 35 minute uh drive to New York City. Wait, what town? It's New Providence. It's right New by Providence. Summit. Oh, I know Summit. Yeah, people, everybody, everybody I've talked to knows Summit. <laughs> A lot of people okay. hang out there. A lot of uh, yeah. actors. Mm-hmm. Very nice part of it. Yeah. No it's, a, no, it's a nice area. We're thinking about maybe moving to Hoboken so we can be closer to the city. And we'd be paying the same that we pay here, so. Hey, why not? Yeah. See that view every morning? Walk outside, walk my dogs, or walk walk my baby and see uh, see New York, the skyline? Can't beat that. Get a lump in your throat. Yes, and I think that's a perfect, that's a perfect way to end this. Lenny was so great, wasn't he? He actually texted me after saying how much he enjoyed the chat. Maybe I'm getting better at this. If so, I'm coming after you, Larry King. Or maybe Lenny was just being nice. I'll go with the former, not the latter. Well, Lenny was in so many amazing films and TV shows, so I put his IMDb link in the notes so you can check him out. And here is a snippet of next week's interview with Kevin Kilner, who played the dad in the movie. Like local around here, just like tri-state area commercials? No, nah, they were they were national. I mean, I I, I was a I was the Stroh's beer guy for a while. I had this dog who would bury a beer truck, and what else? The dog ordered a he ordered a side of beef, a poodle, and a and a case of Stroh's. When this is before Stroh's was, uh, I think Stroh's doesn't exist anymore. I, I, I know. I was gonna say I never heard of that before. Yeah, no, but Stroh's was a big brand out of Milwaukee really? for a while. So I did that. I did Miller. I did uh, I did what was the big? I kind of. Uh, Medicwell. I did a Medicwell commercial that ran for a long time. And, um, uh, Red Lobster. I remember I did a Red Lobster commercial, and I remember I remember that because they were laughing at me. And they said, "You know, you should spit the lobster legs." Uh, they um, it was King Crab Claws. They said, "You should spit that out because we're going to do probably fifty to sixty takes." 
And I looked at the guy and he started laughing. I said, man, I grew up near the Chesapeake Bay. We, we eat crab like, you know, like p- other people eat crackers. Like I'm eating this stuff. <laughs> like, you know, you get to like the 24th take and you're like, okay, I'm spitting this stuff. <laughs> <You> know, <right? laughs> oh, that's great. Kevin has some wild stories. So subscribe to us right now. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on it. Don't forget to review, rate, and share our podcast. Please, please, please write us a review helps us out and follow us on Twitter at sequels only. Good night.